back to this uh, le last lecture of this summer short course series. Now, we covered the fundamentals of uh, nonlinear nonlinear response function, and uh, some you know we actually calculated to show you the four terms. What's that? Photons related to the third order signals that we are most interested in. Okay. First order signal or first order response is related to first order experiments such as uh, linear absorption, linear emission, or fluorescent spectrum. They are not very informative. You really need more uh, pulses and the more degrees of freedom of control of your experiment in order to probe some uh, key dynamics in the normal, uh, more complex systems. However, the second order signal, signal response for an uh, isotropic homogeneous system is zero by definition, but not by the by its symmetry. Okay. It's non-zero when the system is non-isotropic and isotropic, such as on a membrane surface will be non-zero. So second order technique such as the sound frequency generation technique were very popular and very useful, very powerful in probing surface dynamics, for example, structure of uh, surface water clusters, for example. However, for the system that we are interested in, normally a second order, uh, second order response is zero. So the next non-vanishing order of the response is the third order. It corresponds to the interaction of the system with three laser pulses. Okay, so we're interested in three uh, in those third order experiments. And next time I should show you that if you consider the whole third order polarization, the calculation of that quantity is highly non-trivial. It involves triple integral over many many turns. I write down the expression again here. So the third order polarization can be written as this Then you have the response function, third order response function of your system. S. And next time we mention that there are six turns. If we have three pulses, each pulse contributes a rotating and counter rotating turns in the pulse. You have three pulses, you have six turns in each of those electric fields. 6 times 6 times 6 times you have 8 over 4 by compass country 4 times here so 6 times 6 times 6 times 4 in total you have uh, 864 turns and it's impossible to evaluate all the turns according to this equation triple integral over 800 turns just not possible so we need to make further approximations in order to have any interpretation of those three, of those third order experiments. Luckily, those approximations that I'm going to mention here are usually very good approximations. The first approximation regards the duration or the width of the pulse, the pulse width. Normally in those spectral second, uh, in those deep time result, multi-pulse experiments a highly compressed femtosecond laser pulses, a highly compressed laser uh, femtosecond pulses are used. Okay. So we can consider that the pulse width is very small, the pulse is very narrow, very, it spends very short in time, normally 
40 nanosecond, 20 nanosecond pulses are used. So in that case, we can consider that the pulse is an impulsive pulse. It's called impulsive. Impulsive limit, we can write <coughs> each pulse as a delta function in time. The pulse profile can be delta function. It's na so narrow that it's re represented by delta function. So if we have three pulses, each pulse e i uh, yeah e See here, I write the fre frequency phase component, and uh, it's spatial, it's a uh, wave vector component here. Okay, so this represent. Actually, I should write two terms. One is plus minus. The other one is this complex term. Second pulse, and this means that this pulse comes in at time zero. Delta function at time zero. And E two comes in after a population a, a coherence time delay, so it will come in P minus a half. And here I will use uh, more convenient. Uh, just keep in mind that this indicates two terms. So you have plus minus. Very often we like to denote this graphic. We have a time, we have a three delta function pulses. First one coming in at time zero. The time delay here is tau. The time delay here is t. So this is. this going to help us? Because in this case, we can carry out the integration. We can carry out the integration. And there's no pulse overlap. There's no pulse overlap. So you have uh, e any, at any instance of time, okay, within any instance of your integration, these three terms uh, here, And this exact time period, only E1 will contribute. 
only this part to compute. Totally, E is E1 plus E2 plus E3. This is your post profile, total profile. It has three components, one, two, three. But at this period of time, T minus T3, this is actually this time period. Okay. Only this force will contribute. So far and so forth. So it's E2 contributes, E1 contributes. And each turn now became only two turns will contribute because now each one has two turns only. Okay? So by making this import uh, approximation, you consider experiment at the impossible limit. There is no pulse overlap. No pulse overlap. At any instance of time, only one turn will contribute. Only one pulse will contribute to this to the uh, spam to the signal. So you end up with two times two times two. Those are field contributions times four. Now you have uh, thirty-two times. This is already a significant reduction in the original 800 and something, 864 turns. Okay. So the, in the original expression, at some point in time, you can have contribution from two different pulses, two different turns. But in this case, only one contributes to the signal. Think about it. So in this case, because at each point of time only one turn contributes, so this set of it will proportional to E1 times E2 times E3, then you will deal with a T. Instead of using T3, T2, T1, I use how so T population time or delay time, and this is replacing time T with uh, different symbols. Because later on we are going to consider photon echo, we just put it. And also in this, in this case, as I mentioned, you can carry out the integration, delta function, right? So it became proportional field strength. And clearly, the signal or the polarization depends on the third order of the field strength. If you use the same pulse three times, then you have E to E cubic. Okay. And this makes the calculation much simpler and actually possible. And actually possible. You just calculate Now the second approximation we want to carry out is the rotating wave approximation. You notice here that there is a the clockwise rotating and uh, another counter rotating It's easier to explain this using first order uh, response. So I will, use, I will use linear response to give you an explanation. But the same idea applies to three poses, okay? So let's say in a first order response, linear response, and 
inner expansion R1 about the uh, proportional constant. Now, if we consider this, here, and uh, assume a pure state dynamics, a pure state dynamics, meaning, let's just assume you have a ground state and inside this state. Just for simplicity, here I only want to give you a, a qualitative argument here. For what is this approximation and how come it is valid? So let's consider this time evolution. Time evolution. And recall that this type of operator, what's significant in this type of operator in this case is the Transition dipole. We want to look at the transition from ground state to set state and then back to ground state, driven by the uh, uh, metal field interaction. So this will be um, And this average here is actually over trace over rho eq, rho eq initially the system in the ground state, right? So ground state. We did this before. We did this before, so I'm just going to do it quickly. So here you have ground state. Ground state pick up ground state part here, right? And what's remaining here will be, okay, maybe I'll do it, I'll do it slowly. So let's calculate this, trace over this, uh, here will be U, uh, mu of T, so mu of T is, evolution operator exponential minus I over H bar H of T the mean of T that's Dagger, U dagger, this is time evolution operator. So this is mu t. Then the mu zero. So here you have ground state, you pick up this turn, this turn goes away. 
here the E, so you pick up this turn, this turn goes away. So let's operate on G, let's operate on E. Right? Can you see that? Right? So you have uh, this thing will, will not, in this case, not, not, approx not approximate, but E equals to, you take the trace, you only pick up the bond state. One, those two are actually complex conjugates. H bar epsilon G minus epsilon E. Okay. I will call this H bar minus I omega uh, E G. Omega E G is uh, so now here is this H bar. Right. It should be right. So let me say, I'll, I'll continue here. Don't need any use. So let's turn actually go select the transition dipole square. Has a phase factor. Evolves, evolves like minus i omega g g t. We show you a graphic representation, double sided from a diagram for this term. For oh, so this term. This side one, right? right? So now, if we consider here, this is the T we talk about here. The time evolution of this system, actually, of this turn, actually, is because when first force comes in, it decides the system, it kicks the system into a short position where it says it's the ground state, produce this coherence. And what is this, the time evolution of this coherence? The time evolution of this coherence is Here, here is 
echelon E, right? Minus I echelon E. Plus I echelon G. Plus I echelon G. What I'm saying is the phase factor, phase evolution we derive on this calculation is exactly the same as if you think of the system involved in this case, in this Feynman diagram. In this diamond, double sided Feynman diagram. So by looking at this Feynman diagram, you should know, well, this, this diagram, the response actually has a phase evolution like this. Okay? And the signal, oh, I can erase this. The third order polarization, the first, oh, sorry, here is first order polarization. So the first order polarization is proportional to this interval. This electric field, let's just plug in one component here. And for simplicity, I don't want to write too many, too long an expression. Here I will ignore this spatial, this is basically what we need spatial part. But I ignore this spatial part. Okay. And first force comes in at some time. Here is the pulse carrier frequency. It's potential. Minus I omega U. And this should price the this response in G square by this point. Minus I omega U. Recognize that omega E G is positive. Excited state one state. This is excited state minus one state. So it's positive. Okay. So when you plug, when we modify this into here, it's here. First of all, this integral only yields significant value when these two frequencies are the same, right? Consider this as a Fourier representation. This is slow, mo slow moving. <coughs> Slowly changing. This is the post profile. Slowly changing. This asks this quickly. And only when omega eg when these two frequencies are close to each other, then you have a significant signal. This is the resonance condition. This is the resonance condition. Otherwise, you have a slow moving, a slow, slowly changing function. You have a quickly oscillating function. Multiply these two to this integration from zero to infinite. Everything cancels out. You don't have any contribution. So this is resonance condition. Even at resonance, even when this condition, when this condition is right, this comes in here. This is plus. This is minus. 
So you can slow out, you have a, this can slow, slow moving, or slowly change path. However, these two turns will not cancel out, right? This turn will move or will change in an even higher frequency, even smaller value. So this turn is not going to contribute. So effectively, if we recognize the resonance condition, and then we evolve everything based on a rotating frame. Okay, we remove any, in this case, I will call this, I will call this rotating, uh, uh, clockwise rotating wave. Then we are not going to have contribution from those anti-clockwise rotating wave. This is the normal argument for rotating wave approximation. It's a stationary phase approximation. So in that case, although you have a two turns in each laser field, you only pick up one turn. And this turn, which turn you pick up, is determined by the energy gap. Omega E G. If you are consider another, if you consider another type one, complex conjugate like this, you excite G E. It rotates at a, a, a different a, a different direction, right? In that case, you will pick up this turn because that turn corresponds to in, uh, this is this is actually. Anyway, this uh, one is absorption, the other one is emission. Okay. Okay. So then you further simplify. In the end, first pause you pick up one turn, one turn, one turn. You only have a four, four turns. And those photons correspond to the photons in response functions. And those are four different time ordering of uh, time correlation function. Four type time correlation function. Okay. Now finally, even in those photons, we can further distinguish terms based on a condition called phase measure. I just erased that, but actually each turn has a frequency component or phase component as well as a spatial component that contains the wave vector of the pulse. Okay? Now we want to look at those wave vectors. This turn is depending on phase measure. Now you recognize that your electric field, in this case, is in this form, minus I, omega I, P plus I, omega I, R. And due to the rotating wave approximation or the argument that we made, each there will be a pathway. There will be a pathway. Because of its time evolution, it, pick up, it picks up for 
each laser process it takes up only one distance rotating or counter rotating turns. At the same time, um, question? direction, a specific wave vector, or vector. In this case, you pick up the wave ve vector of uh, uh, this plus k wave vector. Okay? This time you pick up a minus k wave vector. So, here, not only we can say that you actually have uh, uh, omega i coming in, omega 1 with only one pulse. You can also space up, specify this have plus k1 contribution in its direction. Now, you can imagine, I'll just copy here, because this is just for illustration, very simple idea. You can imagine you have a complex conjugate here. This is, this is its complex conjugate, right? This, although you still absorb but you, pr you pick up its complex conjugate, naturally. So you pick up the minus omega one component. Or here I actually use omega zero. Okay. Doesn't matter. But minus k one. Minus k one. Because that case, you will pick up this component. Then you have a minus k1. Here. Am I right? No, here you actually pick up this. I'm glad I write it.
thing I miss when minus is fine somewhere. I need to find this. I'm going to let you know I have a plus sign here, but I don't think I don't think the plus sign here is right. Just calculate. It's minus sign. So look at this propagation. Minus I omega E. Minus I omega E plus. You take it. I think what I missed here is actually this is absorption turn. Actually, in a quantized field, this turn corresponds to this A data. And this turn gives you a nice function. A turn. So let me go back and check this. But I think what I just missed, or oh, I uh, mistook the definition for the k way back to k minus i k r. Okay. So when we say the way back to is k, we we'll plug in here. This minus sign is here. But this is the only way I can. This here in a consistent measure. I will go back and check. I forgot the base here. Okay, but I think this the it's in there. It's in there. But I know what I'm just going to say is correct. I mean what I just say here. This must be correct. So this corresponds to a wave coming in at the plus k1 direction. Forward. Direction. K1 direction. And when it's on the other side, it's complex is complicated. This is minus K1 direction. Okay, so let's keep this convention. Now, if you have a particle wave interaction, absorption coming from the kit side. A Plus K wave. Okay. You pick up a positive wave vector. On the other hand, if you come from the broad side, okay. 
you know, pick up a minus k. What that thing? This, I'm sure, is right. Okay. And by the law of conservation of momentum for photons, the signal must come out because each time you can pick up a absor absorption emission part. They have a different wave vectors. So this signal can be plus minus k1 plus post k2 plus minus k3. You see, in total, there are eight different directions. So the signal come out at different combination of the wave vectors. By conservation of uh, energy, omega s is the signal, uh, angular frequency of this signal coming out. You can have uh, absorption or emission, so it will be omega 1, omega 2, plus minus omega 3. When you pick up each pulse, you can pick up the absorption part or the emission part. The resistance energy can increase or decrease. And in the end, the signal coming out should have this combination. And each Rn turns. Now I'm talking about the third order response functions. four times, right? R1, R2, R3, R4. I mentioned in the last lecture that those are, when you use three poses, you can only make four distinct double-sided Feynman diagrams. R1 turns this, R1. I just draw an arrow right now. But now we can pick up, determine, determine the wave vector of each signal coming out from different terms. So here is post one, so you have a plus K1. This side. This is a uh, emission that changes sign. It's also coming out from the broad side. It changes sign again, right? So it changes sign twice. Nothing changed. So it's plus k three. Plus k three. And this is your signal. So your signal in R one comes out from k three. No, in no, we will write K1 first. Plus K1 minus K2 plus K3. K1 minus K2 plus K3 direction. Second one. 
here coming out from the broad side, so minus k1, first post coming up in here. Second post plus k2. Third post here plus k3. So here, this R2 pathway gives rise to a signal coming out from minus k1 plus k2 plus k3. This R3 turn here, minus k1 plus k2 plus k3. So signal R2 turn, uh, sorry, R3, R3 turn. The signal, so we, there's some overlap here, but if you keep track of it. Minus k1 plus k2 plus k3. Sorry, I copied the wrong diagram. Now this one is correct. But let's check. This is my minus K1. Right? K2, now it's emission, so it's plus K2. K3 coming in from here, so it's plus K3. So the signal for R3 is minus k1 plus k2 plus k3. The R4 turn gives you here plus k1 first post, second post minus k2, third post plus k3. So signal So you recognize that R2 and R3 both come out at the minus K1 plus K2 plus K3 direction. Whereas R2 and R, R, R1 and R4, R1 and R4, they come out at K1 minus K2 plus K3 direction. So by picking one, picking one direction in your up uh, in your measurement, this can be done by arranging your laser forces to be centered at the same spot while their uh, direction is slightly changed, slightly varied. Normally, one can do this in a cross cut geometry in which you pass the laser forces pointing at the three tips of a, 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 a square. What I'm saying is.
This is your sample. You know what I mean. Light travel in a straight line, not a line like this. But you know what I mean. And I can say this is K1, K2, K3, and then it's a K1. Your signal, you you measure your signal coming out from your sample. And with this hole, that you in, you pick a hole here. Okay. And this is the K uh, minus K one. So you center here, right? So minus K one flips one direction. The principle is you, one will choose to choose a direction for measurement, for a measurement. In that case, you can pick up two, only two of those diamonds contributing to your signals. And the experiment we want to further emphasize is the experiment done at this plus K1 plus K2 plus K3 direction. This is photovoltaic. It's a long way to here. Well, let's see. Now we can talk about photon echo. Photon echo is an experiment that you measure the signal at the direction plus K1 plus K2 plus K3. Using the phase measure. In a photo echo experiment, usually here we talk specifically about three poles photo echo. Three poles. Because there's also a two poles photo echo. In that case, the first two poses comes in at the same time. Delay between first two poses is tau, P, and your signal coming out. Signal. It's 
how it's called coherence time. So T is called population time. And finally, this T is called rebasing time. Some people call this delay time, some people call this echo time, it's all the same, it refers to the same quantity. Basic experimental setup is, like I mentioned, using a bus cut or you sometimes use uh, triangular setup. Okay. You just different uh, technical points of uh, doing how you actually measure this. Okay. It's called photon echo because it has this photon echo effect that eliminates. Eliminates homogeneous and uh, homogeneous photon in homogeneous. To illustrate this point, we will use a simple uh, two level homophone case. So we consider the ground state and the excited state. Last time I emphasized that I didn't put in specific density matrix elements here because that depends on the system. Okay. So to construct a full diagram, you need to specify density matrix elements, but that depends on the system. A little bit later we'll show this. But now if I specify to have a two level system ground state, it's a state, the simplest system for this experiment to be minimal. Then we can specify R2 and R3. Because come in is addition from G to E. Goes out emission from E to G. Right. So the work will be very simple to write down those two diagrams. Oh, is that the yeah. So in this simplest case, for a single homophone which you only look at a resonance interaction between a ground state and one excited state. Then the two turns contribute to signal at the minus k1 plus k2 plus k3 direction. Can be represented using fire diagrams like this. So you always start at GG. R2 turn. K1, first pulse hit from the bra side first. And then here. Then you also have R3.
Well, let's take a look at R2 plus R3. Because, as you can see, this is intention from the plus side. They have a minus sign. It's, com it's, it's commutator, right? So everything from this side is positive. From this side, it gives you a minus sign. Minus sign here, positive sign. Minus sign here, you have two minus signs. So in the end, this is a positive signal. Okay? Later on, we will talk about a situation. Actually, this intention can come from here. To further excite your state from excited state to a even higher excited state. Let's call it set state adoption. That contribution, that contribution will give you one intention on the uh, broad side only. So that contribution is negative. negative. So the state adoption gives you negative signal. Okay? So we can also account for the sign of this this this, this term. Here yeah, again, okay. negative sign, negative sign. You have uh, positive. So R2 plus R3. R2 plus R3. Will contribute to your total response function, S. And actually, you have a R2 complex conjugate and R3 complex conjugate that you should subtract from your end result. So your S will be. R2 minus R2 conjugate, complex conjugate, plus R3 minus R3 complex conjugate. Okay. Now, with this diagram, we can actually write down its expression. And actually, you don't have to memorize or copy from those definition R2, R3 is from the four time type of equation. We can write down that from here. Okay? I'll show you how. So here, R2. I'll show you how for R2. Uh, it will be, well, in the end, we should trace over everything. Right? System starts from GG to here. So you start from here. This represents the equilibrium for the initial state of your system. So you have a rho minus infinite. Right? And the time zero, the system is hit by a type of operator from the Cross side. Like. So this is the first pulse. I'll write this. First pulse. First pulse. After the first pulse, the system evolves for a time tau. So we can write down the propagator. Evolve time tau, and you know just for to make sure everything is on the same page. After less, you evolve. So you know where you need to place the time evolution operators. Okay. And then, you hit on the cat side by another pulse. So now you hit here. This is the second pulse. Evolved by time from T, population time. Okay, for to make sure everything is on the same page. And then on the right hand side, you have another pulse coming in. And in the end, you evolve on time. 
在现场有 key。And finally, you do the measurement. And you can actually show that this this expression corresponds to the high correlation function that we mentioned before. This is I just copied that high correlation function. I didn't actually derive that. I, it's a good practice for you to go back and check whether this is right. This uh, is R2, so it should be equal to mm. Go back, expand all the time variation operators. Insert all the time variation operators at the right position. You should get it. Okay. So in practice, we often write down the diagram first. And then we calculate the response function from this diagram. Okay? This enables us enables us to easily account for those basically are there from perturbations, those are perturbative terms. Now this is called photon echo. Why? a very important um, very important point very important point again we will explain by the diagram here recall the time evolution we'll, we'll, we'll look at this term this term here this time evolution oh first first of all first firstly usually this is called population time, and it's obvious if you look at this type one here, because at this point, the system is prepared in a population state. EE is a population. GG is a population. Either it's a state population or bound state population. Okay? Now this is an off diagram that test matrix elements. It has time evolution. And it has some phase oscillation. And this phase of uh, oscillation corresponds to the, so this phase of uh, phase oscillation has the uh, frequency of uh, corresponds to the energy gap of these two states. And we mentioned for the linear case, this is third order case, but at this period of time, the time evolution operator does the same thing. This term, this part will gives you uh, exponential i omega g e omega g how base vector, right? This will gives you a exponential i omega e g. How omega g is omega g minus omega e. Omega e g is omega e minus omega g. Let us just complex calculate. Sorry, this is not how this is. This evolves for tau time about for t, time, tau and t. And you recognize that at the point that t equals to tau, when t equals to tau, these two phase oscillating terms will cancel out each other, right? And in that case, this type one, this response function does not oscillate. Okay, so we have uh, uh, the 
exactly the same sort out. That's better. And uh, it would have it would give rise to this uh, refocusing or echo effect. Normally people explain this using a simplified version for the high evolution. This photon echo effect is most pronounced when we consider a system with strong inhomogeneity. So strong inhomogeneous. does this mean? This means when you measure the absorption spectrum of a system, you see, you might see a very broad peak, broad band. And the reason for this absorption spectrum to have a distribu distribution is because actually this system is highly disordered. The disorder means each component, each component of a system absorbs or emits at a quite different frequency. Okay. You have some ensembles within this system. Every system is different. And it's very frequ uh, frequently the case in systems such as in proteins or in glass, in solids. Okay. So in that case, actually, this very broad band is, con is, is constructed from many, many nanons. Options. And each absorption, each nano band is due to some subpopulation, sub ensemble within your total system. Okay. So we will say now this system might have some average energy, but each sub ensemble, this I sub ensemble, will have some energy difference deviation from this average energy. Actual real plus delta actual I. Okay. So every system has a slightly different energy. This energy is small. The high delay tau or t that we are interested in those uh, photon echo measurements are very small. Small energy. Small high delay. Small t or tau means. When we look at or look into this phase evolution, this is measure I omega G E tau. Now it can exponential I omega G E now corresponds to this energy differences for each sub number. Okay? For each component in your system then have uh, action zero plus delta action. Okay. Now this is uh, exponential i action zero tau times. This term is actually not that interesting or not important here. But data part is difference due to state disorder different sub example, and this time is very small. So this is exponential. This is two exponentials, right? We expand the second exponential up to the linear order. So this will approximately one plus i. I shouldn't say action. I will say omega zero. So action zero corresponds to omega zero. So this will be some omega zero plus delta omega i. So I can write or I can try to express this effect of a steady disorder within this linear phase evolution. Okay? So, what happens? In a system, if 
we monitor the base evolution of the system, the total system in time. In time. Okay. And we neglect that neglect this turn. Because eventually this turn in resonance condition, this turn will be cancelled out by the phase uh, evolution of uh, your laser field. We just mentioned this rotating wave for fast measures. Right? So this turn will Pencil out by the your your field turn in rotating wave approximation. What remaining is this linear phase shift. Turn. So if you pick one component, imagine that you can do this experiment in a highly disordered system. Let's say many many proteins. We pick one protein and monitor monitor the phase change, phase evolution, or phase change of this protein is at this state, <coughs> set state, when different pulse comes in, okay? So the first, before the first pulse, nothing happens. You are in the GG state, there's no phase evolution. When first pulse comes in, the system is decided to a, this coherence state, superposition state, you start to have a phase evolution, this is phase evolution, Goes like this, meaning it depends on the different sub ensemble. If we pick one protein, this protein has a, a delta omega. It will evolve in time, linear. If you pick another protein, pick a mouse, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use a kinine first. If you pick another protein, now you have a different energy shift, right? Different omega i. This protein will give you a signal, a uh, phase evolution here. Okay. And you pick many, many, many more proteins. So for each sub ensemble, each subsystem, So this part is the phase evolution i delta omega i. Sorry, I forgot tau here. The tau expansion has tau, right? And the tight tau. So here is tight tau. The second pulse comes in. Second pulse comes in. This pulse brings your system into a diagonal population state. In population state, there is no phase evolution, right? So your phase will stay the same as previous phase. So your phase can be the same. The horizontal line. comes in. Now this pulse will set the system back to some superposition state and use begin to have phase evolution again. But the trick here is this phase evolution is in a totally different direction than the previous phase evolution. You have a minus sign here. Okay. So now the previously when it comes up, we will go down. Now you have a phase evolution like this. Because this pi goes like minus i delta omega i t. And right at the point 
you have a refocusing or echo. of the signal. Now imagine each one is a wave, one of mechanics is a wave, right? If you average, in the end, you try to uh, decide all the sub numbers, you collect data from all of them. Each one means a wave. But this, what this tells you is, each sub number will mean the wave at a different phase, different phase. If you collect the signal, and all those waves are in, all those waves has a different, uh, have a different uh, phases. When you collect the signal, you effectively average over all the signals of them. You will have a small signal, right? Right? Imagine you have many, many waves, but their phase is random, randomized. The signal goes down. However, if all of them have the same phase, you will have a strong signal, okay? So in principle, if you can do measurement at a very short time here, you will see the signal is very small, increase to some very strong, strong signal value, and then diverge again, so the, the signal goes down again, okay? And this is called photon echo. The same principle, principle, the same principle, very similar to comes with the so-called uh, AMR spin echo experiments. And what's important or what's good about this is at this point, the phase of the system is independent of uh, the slightly energy difference from different sub numbers. I'll write it down. So you eliminate, you can get rid of uh, static disorder, you get rid of uh, the inhomogeneity in the system. This diagram or this analogy is called the uh, lens analogy. Lens, uh, this is a lens diagram. Lens analogy. approximate this process using the refocusing, the refocusing of uh, the phase of the system. So imagine you have two lens here. Right, let me, you, you see this before, right? Now, imagine that in addition to the so this photon echo, we explain photon echo. Now, further imagine that in addition to the static disorder, your system have a dynamical disorder. So your system intrinsically has some environment random at time, instance of a time randomize the phase a little bit, right? So this phase evolution became randomized. Randomized, so it's randomized. So it has some different drift. Probably, you know, still follow the previous, the previous uh, line a little bit. Phase can drift dynamically, dynamical disorder, dynamical. So dynamical disorder introduced phase drifts.
within the population time period. Within the population time period. And when you increase the population time, this dynamical disorder will destroy more and more the base uh, stability in your system, right? So your echo signal will reduce, will go down, will go down. So that's the idea or the uh, key between be between so-called three post-photon echo peak shift experiment, three paths. But basically, you can use this to measure the, the dynamical disorder or the memory, memory of your system. And it's an effective tool to measure the system best coupling okay. of important quantities related to spatial density in your system. In a weak coupling case, you can use peak shift to measure the time correlation function of your system. K of the peak shift effectively represents the time current function of energy gap fluctuation. I don't have time to go into details over there. And that experiment is a very difficult or very complicated experiment, very difficult to interpret. Not many experimental groups uh, carry out that experiment, so I'm not going to mention specifically that experiment. Now, this is a uh, two-level system, one state, one excited state. What if we have um, more multiple excited states? Okay. So, if we have uh, a dimer system, you have two molecules. Each molecule can be excited. Their excitation energy could be the same or different. Uh, I will call one is one, the other one is called two. Just like when we describe the, uh, when, you, when we use the Franco Eston model in describing uh, excitation energy transfer problems. So I'll consider a diamond system, diamond system that gives rise to two acetone states, according to E1 and E2. And of course, the system can be excited to two acetone states, E1 and E2. Uh, E1 and E2 both excited. both excited. In this case, in this case, the energy level is like this. both excited, we'll call this F. This, this is just the convention we use a lot when we describe uh, our, our work in 2D structure. I'm going to talk about 2D. So now let's look at R2 or R3 contribution, and there they are now more probabilities, actually. For example, you can say your system, now I write it differently. So from ground state, to ground state E1, here, from to E1, 
one. So this will be one variable that contributes to your signal, right? And you then you can also have uh, the E1 replaced by E2. Those variables I'm not going to list all of them. Now you can also have uh, this. So this is a static state assumption. Static state assumption contribution. Now this population state is further excited to be doubly excited state. Double H double state. Then you have the emission from that double H double state. Static state absorption. Um, And we can also have uh, diamonds like this one. Contribution from E1 and contribution from E2. Okay. In a photon echo pick shift of normal photon echo experiment, the collective integrated signal coming out from the system is being measured. So in the end, you do not distinguish this E1 contribution versus this E2 contribution. Uh, I compare this two. So this one and this two. This one. In uh, integrated photon echo experiment, you cannot distinguish them. However, we can do the experiment differently. I lost the post. This is parameter you have uh, first pulse, right? Second pulse, third pulse. So we have a tau, population time, and regression time t. Now if you carry out the measurement by sending the signal at the phase matching direction minus k1 plus k2 plus k3, into a spectrometer and measure the spectrum of a, the signal. Normally, this is done by combining this emitted, emitted signal with a local oscillator and perform a so called hash time detection. Okay. But those are technical points. Basically, you, you measure the spectrum. So at each tau, T delay at each high delay, you have one spectrum. That spectrum will tell you the oscillation of the uh, high evolution of your system within the replacing time or echo time period, T. Further, if you fix the population time and scan tau. You can do the measurement at different tau, many different tau. 
right? So now you have a list, and each tile you have a, a spread chunk. And another tile you have another spread chunk. Another spread chunk, another spread chunk. Okay? And then you can actually carry out a Fourier transform along top. Long top. So you have a long top, you have another frequency omega top. And a fixed population time. So for each fixed population time, you can do an experiment and obtain a two-dimensional correlation map of your signal as a function of omega tau and the omega t. This technique is called the two-dimensional electronic spectroscopy, 2D spectroscopy. This 2D spectroscopy tells you how the signal of a system being excited. So this is excitation. This is when the system is excited, prepared in a state. This signal comes out from the time evolution of the light, initially prepared state. So this is the input. And uh, finally, the output of the state. So if we have a signal at some point, that means at that initial excitation, the initial excitation, in the end, eventually evolves, after this phi t, evolves into the state that is measured in your output. I don't have time to go into more details, but I will show you how 2D can do here. Because now 2D can distinguish the initial frequency and signal output frequency. And let's look at here. This is tau, right? This is tau. This is t. This is population time. This is refraction time. Okay. So here, this is like evolves at E1 frequency or E1 G frequency. And that's because of uh, resonance excitation by this pulse here. I will call this omega 1, not pulse 1. Now, now it's not pulse 1, first pulse. No, it's due to E1. It's action E1 divided by H bar. First, uh, first H tone state. This is also at omega 1, omega 1. Signal comes out at omega 1, omega 1. At this end, so in 2D, we expect this signal to come out at the omega 1, omega 1 position. Here is omega tau, here is omega t. This is will be omega tau. This will be your omega t. Right? Now, how about this diagram? This comes out at omega 2. It meets at e, um, e two. This is basically one is that by E1? So this will come out at omega one. Okay. It's already exactly to E2, so the double excitation from E2 to F has approximately the energy of E1. Right? So this is omega one. So this comes out and it comes in with omega 2. Signal coming out is omega 1. Right? Uh, you can have a population turn like this comes out at omega 2, omega 2. That's diagonal omega 2 turns. So we call this Omega, omega 1, 
iesies tēdu no tik. Coming in, coming out at the same position, you will be show up at the diagonal of your 2D structure. This is the off diagonal. Now this peak or this contribution, you can go in and do the calculation. This contribution is only non-zero when E1 and E2 are correlated. I mean, when E1 and are superposition states that have uh, correlations. Meaning, when in this timer system, those two, when those, only when those two timers are coupled to each other, then you will have this contribution. There are other contributions that I didn't write, I cannot write down actually. A good reference of this will be uh, either Peter Ham's book or uh, Midnight Cho in 2005. Yeah, I think 2005. I, I will upload that, that paper also to SETA. I promise that. He basically lists the diagram for diamond system. Of them. There are many more because up to this point, I didn't consider intrinsic dynamics in the system. You can actually excite the system to E2, yet the system Hamiltonian itself will evolve and uh, go to E1, okay? So that will be represented by a diagram. Like this. We start with GG, excite. But during the population time, the E2 state is being cited, but it can relax to E1 state. We talked about this before. We use the field equation to describe this dynamics. We can actually calculate it, the transfer rate, from one eigenstate to another eigenstate, right? So this can actually evolve into E1, E1. This will be a population transfer relation transfer, energy transfer. And then you come out from here. So you see here, you cite the omega two, in the end, you emit at omega 1, the signal come out at omega 2, omega 1 position. This will be an off-diagonal peak, showing the energy transfer dynamics. Now, because this time period is, is T, population time, so if you change the population time, you will see this off-diagonal peak grows. Right? If you have more time to transfer, you will measure this signal more. Okay? So by monitoring the decay of diagonal peak, diagonal peak disappears. Or the growth of uh, the growth of uh, off diagonal peak, you can monitor the energy transfer dynamics directly. There are other tricky things in 2D. For example, this diagram. This diagram now excites at omega 1, emits at omega 2, so it's an off diagonal peak showing up at omega 1 and omega 2. 
But now at the population time period, T, the system is not prepared in a population state, in a coherent state. Whenever you have a coherence, you have a phase evolution. So now if you measure the signal as a function of a t, population time, you will see this contribution oscillate, going from some positive value, going back negative, and positive negative, with the splitting. Okay. So this is called quantum electronic quantum splitting. Beating at the energy of the energy gap. Beating at the heat energy of the energy. Beating at the frequency corresponding to the energy gap. Okay, so the beating frequency will be omega E2 plus omega E1. Depends on the energy gap. There are more, but we have we don't have time to cover all of them. Uh, as I mentioned, I've, I'll, I'll upload Wen Chou's paper, and I already upload upload uh, my paper regarding this BT signal, and uh, one of our review paper in 2D electronic spectroscopy on to SEPA. So if you are interested in this technique, you should read those papers by yourself, and welcome to send me emails or come to me to ask questions. The details of that will be a little bit complicated. And I don't have time to show you the slides on um, information content in 2D spectroscopy. But I also upload a set of a slide PowerPoint file on the SEPA. So you can actually read, go through those slides. Okay? And that demonstrates some of the powerful uh, thing, information, important information that can be obtained using 2D spectroscopy. It's a very important tool. Important, I don't know, but it's a very powerful tool. Very powerful tool. Yeah, and hopefully I describe the gist or the, some key idea in this. One thing uh, I want to mention here is, now in the end you see that if you want to include all its dynamics, and then to this perturbative expansion, counting order terms, it's impossible to do. In the response function formula, then it's very difficult to carry out this post overlap in, in, in integration and actually examine the post overlap effect. Whenever you have a post overlap, it becomes very tedious and very difficult to treat. You need to deal with this three point equal. Three point equal is non trivial deal with. So in the end, nobody actually you know, go to the, the third or the response function to the perturbation and you know, do the expansion one by one. Normally what we do is we pick or we select key diagrams, key double-sided Feynman diagrams that contributes to your signal. And we compute the contribution of each diagram. Whenever we have a diagram written by this, write down like this, you can come, you can then calculate the relevant time coding function contributes to this diagram. I, I think we demonstrated that already. Okay, so pick those diagrams. Keep note of uh, the sign of each diagram. That's also important. Okay, calculate each diagram and then you sum them up. That's how people go about this business. Okay. And whenever the system's dynamics is in, 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 in bound, it becomes very complicated. Okay, questions? Uh, I will go back and check this uh, web vector issue. You should go back and check it back. But it's actually nothing Nothing difficult. It's just I, I miss one notation here or there. I don't. I don't recall the details. Okay. Okay. So that's it.
Thank you for coming, and uh, hopefully this is useful for you. And uh, for my students, I think you need to know this kind of stuff, okay? And be able to actually carry out those deviations. It's, it's a good practice. It's good practice. Okay, so thank you.